Uh, tonight's lecture features Bin Don, The Enigma of Belonging, and this is part of the CCA Photography Program Larry Sultan Visiting Lecture Series, as well as our Creative Citizen Series. Uh, Creative Citizens in Action is a college-wide initiative that promotes creative activism and democratic engagement through public programs, exhibitions, and curriculum connections. And this uh, event is specifically funded through a generous endowment gift from the Deborah and Kenneth Novak Creative Citizen Series and funds a, a lot of what we do this year related to creative activism. And our theme for 2023 with the Creative Citizens in Action initiative has been belonging. And that's why we thought this event tonight was so perfect because Ben's new book is called The Enigma of Belonging. And we do have some upcoming events that we wanted to make sure you knew about. We have our Belonging Tea Time series that takes place over at the CCA Campus Gallery. And we do have some additional lectures where we're partnering with each division this semester to sponsor one of the lectures that's part of the larger divisional lecture series. So tonight we're celebrating fine arts with this collaboration. And now I'd like to just start off our evening with our land acknowledgement. So California College of the Arts is located in Yalamu, also known as San Francisco, on the unceded territories of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, and CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders and thank them for their stewardship of the land upon which we stand. So thank you for being here. I realize now that I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Jamie Austin. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs here at CCA, and our department also oversees the Creative Citizens in Action Initiative. And now I would like to invite up Aspen Mays, Chair of CCA's Photography Program, um, as our next speaker. Hi, good evening. Luckily, I won't be actually speaking tonight. I'm just going to introduce our wonderful actual speaker, um, Bid Dunn. So, like Jamie said, my name is Aspen Mays, and I'm the chair of the photography program. And welcome back to our first Larry Sultan lecture of this new school year. Um, I'm so pleased that we can be here tonight to celebrate Larry Sultan's legacy at CCA with artist and brilliant photographer Bin Dunn. Before I introduce him, I would like to offer the following thank yous to those who have made tonight's event possible. The Larry Sultan Visiting Artist Lecture Series is made possible with generous support of Chris McCall, Pier 24 Photography, Debbie Ablin, Kelly Sultan, and Nyan McAvoy, as well as the CCA Fine Arts Division. I want to thank Jamie Austin and the CCA Exhibitions team for all of their support and co-sponsoring this event, as well as the Visionary Creative Citizens in Action Initiative. Um, also, just to bring your attention to some of these other great talks coming up, through Fine Arts. We have one more Larry Sultan lecture scheduled for November 29th, which will also be presented by Pure 24 Photography, and we'll have alumna Eva O'Leary speaking. So please mark your calendars and come back for that. Um, and now I can introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, and if, um, an, inspi an inspiring artist who also happens to live in the Bay Area. If you've ever been lucky enough to see one of his daguerreotypes in person, you will know how truly remarkable and seductive their surfaces are. There is one up right now at um, SF MoMA in the permanent collection exhibition that just opened Sea Change. So if you haven't, if you haven't had a chance to see that yet, um, run, don't walk. So uh, Ben Dunn reconfigures traditional photographic techniques and processes in unconventional ways to delve into the connection between history, identity, and place. Uh, Don is noted for his contemporary daguerreotypes of national parks. Their reflective surfaces enable people of all backgrounds to see themselves as part of the beauty of the American landscape. His work has been collected by the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the San Jose Museum of Art, among others. He is an associate professor of art at San Jose State University, and following the talk, um, we'll have a Q&A. So just save up all your questions for when Ben is done. And uh, without further ado, Ben Don.
All right. Thank you so much. I want to just um, jump in right into it. Um, whoa, my notes are really huge. <laughs> okay, I just use a straw bars here. So, so thank you, Aspen and Jamie, for welcoming me to your community and giving me, giving me the honor to participate in the Larry Sultan Lecture Series. I want to mention how much Sultan's work influenced me during my years as an art student. His series, Pictures from Home, encouraged me to consider my family album as a source of creativity. Pictures from Home challenged the mythologies of the family album. We curate our family album to express our sense of belonging. And there has been much discussion about the sense of belonging in recent years. That sense of belonging is crucial to our individual and communal survival. For the BIPOC community, survival is a life or death circumstance. As we observe hashtag Black Lives Matter to hashtag Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. Xenophobia and the fear of the foreigner and otherness have been concept woven into the fabric of our societies from the beginning of our founding. So being part of the BIPOC community, I have learned how to survive. We have been exploring something I call the enigma of belonging. This enigma of belonging is different for each of us because we're all unique in particular ways. Part of understanding the enigma of belonging is understanding whiteness, how it is constructed and the system of privileges and advantages afforded to white Americans through governmental policy, media portrayal, decision-making power within our workplace, schools, judicial system, and the lasting effect of colonialism. So in art school, one of my first body of work explored the family album. I collected family photos I found on eBay. So it was 1998, and eBay was a new dot-com where you could search for anything and purchase the item. And since I didn't have many family photos from past generation, I enjoyed looking at other people's pictures. I was amazed by these families' outings and the sense of closeness, closeness and belonging. So growing up as an Asian American, I became accustomed to not seeing people who look like me. I grew up not knowing my history that was part of this country. I perceived that Americans' history started with only whites, but somehow people of color entered the story. Of course, black, indigenous, and people of color were here initially, but the visual lexicon didn't represent us. So I titled this series, Once White, since all I saw on eBay were white Americans. But I was wrong, the United States was never white. Uh, there were representation of people of color, but most of the time it didn't include us in a good light. So in this series, I contact printed the original photos made from those I found on eBay. I made a paper negative, from the, first from the original, and then um, apply a silver toning to the final positive prints. Um, so they have a silver sheen to them. Um, if writings were on the back of the photos, the writings will also be printed, as you can see in this sample here. And this was the installation. I printed the image onto 11 by 14 or 16 by 20 inch paper. The black background um, alluded to the, the black album pages from which these photos were taken. And while exploring the work, I also um, start learning about my history as an Asian American when I discover ethics study courses as part of a GE requirement. And knowing this history, I started to understand how whiteness works. I grew up believing that whiteness was at the center of everything in our society and everything else was everything else evolves around it. I encountered microaggression but didn't have a way to understand them because no one prepares me for them. And all this contributed to my enigma of belonging. As I continued to search on eBay to collect these photographs, 
I try to find pictures of Asian people. The next set of slides um, are pictures I found and collected on eBay and are, are painful for, for Asian American, but they should all be painful for us to see in the 21st century. However, viewing such artifacts as a learning tool allow us to confront our racist past and, and understanding this great effort to demoralize BIPOC communities. So this is an advertisement to sell corset claps. Here is an illustration of three Chinese laundry workers comp comparing a corset, um, a corset without the new corset claps with one with the cellular claps. And these characters produce a sense of otherness and foreignness. It manifests into the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and promoted yellow face in Western media. And during the California gold rush, Chinese laborers built the railroads track and dug the mines to the gold fields. And many work and many work for themselves, but those depiction were written out of mainstream media. And due to the increase in Chinese immigrants, anti-immigrant anti feelings spread throughout the mining town. And in 19, 1850, the Chinese, the California legislation passed a foreign miners license law, which changed, which charged all non-U.S. citizen twenty dollars um, per month. The law was repealed the following year, but due to these exorbitant fees. Chinese miner left and entered other service economies. So the tin type on the right is one that I collected that shows a more dignifying representation and probably was commissioned by the sitters themselves. And this advertisement was from an Ohio Kentucky, Kentucky liquor store. Notice the poster, Hoodism at Discounted Education and Society for, for Converting Heathens. Distinctive Q hairstyle led to its wearers being targeted during anti-Chinese riots. And this illustration reveals the racist atmosphere of the 19th century, a legacy we have yet to resolve in the 21st century. And during the 20th century wars, during the 20th century wars, the disregard of the dead of war which was displayed by war photography, unlike the way they were in the, those in the 19th century Civil War battlefields photographs, where faster speed films were able to capture scenes in action. The dropping of the atomic bomb in Japan obliterated Asian bodies. The wars in Southeast Asia were photographs from the ground depicting fresh dead bodies in full color and in black and white photography. And the Hollywood movies that were made to tell these stories center on the experience of war with the white protagonists. The experience of civilians, Vietnamese soldiers, and refugees are left out of the stories. So here's a clip from um, Full Metal Jacket where a news crew interviewed Private Davis about what he wants to get out of his tour. These Hollywood depictions also reduce the experiences of the soldiers. I wanted to see exotic Vietnam, the jewel of Southeast Asia. I, uh, I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. I wanted to be the first kid on my block to get a confirmed kill. So you can perceive the sentiments that the lives of Asian people's soldiers or, or civilians are disposable. And that was very evident in the actual war. In Nick Turr's books, Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam, um, official body counts were one of the ways that the US considered that they were winning the war. Turr's writes, under pressure from commanders, low-level officers who haven't met body count expectations were kept their troops in the field longer, courting exhaustion and, and shattered unit morale until, and while exposing themselves and their men to greater chance 
of death and or injury, end of quote. So one of the most common phrases American soldier threw around was, if it's dead, in Vietnamese, it's VC. VC means Viet Cong, a southern Vietnamese guerrilla who fought against the United States and South Vietnamese government during the Vietnam War. So when innocent people die in, in death, they morph into enemy soldier. And growing up, I watched Vietnam War movies in my parents' TV repair shop. In both Hollywood and the real war photographs, I witnessed the horrific image of a war on the body and land. And Vietnam for me was a lush green um, landscape torn apart by war. And when I became an art student, my pondering of the legacy of the Vietnam War deepened. I started collecting cultural materials such as these life magazine here to help me understand what people who lived through it witnessed it. Even having the mailing label still attached to the magazine was meaningful for me. The subscriber witnessed the war in full color. And many of these historical images inspire the series called Immortality, the remnants of the Vietnam and American War. Immortality is the ability to live forever, eternal life. Remnants is a survival trace. And in Vietnam, they refer to it as the American War. And using the pictures I found in my research about the Vietnam War, I printed them onto the leaves by using the light sensitive properties of the leaves, chlorophyll. I call this process chlorophyll prints. I thought, what if the plants could witness these horrific events? What would they remember? What would they say? And what could they teach us? And this body of work deals with an idea I call elemental transmigration, the decomposition and composition of matters into other form. The war became part of the, the landscape, and nature remembered the traumas in the elements that composed the landscape. And we learn in school that all matter is composed of atoms of the various elements. That is, atoms rearrange themselves according to the law of nature. All those atoms that compose us, they carry memories that, that return to the beginning of time and have been in many conflicts before the Vietnam War. The war became part of the landscape and nature remembered the trauma and elements that composed the landscape. So I started this project in 2001, and I presented it as my BFA thesis work. And around the time I mount the show, September 11 happened. Um, in 2010, I had an exhibit at Mills College called Art, a Mills College Art Museum called Collecting Memories. In Collecting Memories, I explored the idea that memories exist in objects, like the artifact left at memorial site. And what comes with memory is the ability to imagine. Every time we remember, we use our imagination to recall a moment in the past and how we see that moment relates to our present day. So memories and imagination are blend to tell stories that connects our history and past to the present time and help us imagine what the future could be like. And this installation is called uh, Military Foliage. I printed on each leaf, um, printed on each leaf is a camouflage pattern from different military organizations. I imagine, imagine if there was no end to war, will plants evolve into these patterns of war as if the plants have the memories of the camouflage human taking over their habitat. And, and I know camouflage is necessary for military conflict, Without it, soldier wouldn't be able to hide in the landscape. But there's something much more troubling to wearing camouflage that we rather not think about, is the possibility of death. When one, when one wears this uniform, one already becomes part of the landscape, stepping into the void and becoming the land itself. And then the artifacts are both public, as in these newspaper clipping, and private, as in the personal photographs of soldiers that soldier carries with them into the landscape. And each of these artifacts is embedded with memories. And they could trigger memories for the viewers, especially at Mills College, where different generation, come, generation comes together to share ideas. 
and I witness viewers sharing their stories with one another. And it, ins and it accomplished one of my main goals in an installation, a place for conversation and contemplation. Um, and we all recognize this picture of a B-52 um, photo, uh, B-52 dropping bombs over Laos. During the war, the United States military used some of the most devastating weapons the war has ever seen. There were more bombs dropped by the United States than all the artillery used during World War II. And to compare how many weapons were unleashed by the United States on Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, imagine one Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb exploding. Now imagine that happening 640 times over. And today, the bomb craters are still visible on the land. I chose this composition suggesting that we are bearing witness to a remnants of war. And for me, the bomb craters are like scars. And scars are reminders of past wounds and the natural process of healing. And today, finding um, throughout Asia, finding bombs is like mining for gold. Most of these scrap materials are melted down and exported to Japan. The cars are then shipped back to the United States. And according to the, the Mines Advisory Group, an organization that clears a landmine throughout the world, at the rate they are currently going, it would take about 400 years to clear all the bombs and landmines out of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. So today, people in these community have been collecting these bombs to recycle them. And most of these, um, the, the, I mentioned that the materials are, are recycled and then they, they're shipped to, to Japan and then these cars will kind of come back to the United States. And I always find that fascinating to think about. In the summer of uh, 1963, there was a wave of um, Buddhist protests against the war and their oppression from the Catholic um, um, government that controlled the South Vietnamese, um, South Vietnam. This protest was made famous by the Malcolm Brown photograph where a Buddhist monk named Thich Huat Duc set himself on fire. And the car that transported him to Saigon is now a relic at the per Perfume Pagoda in central Vietnam, where I made this photograph. And this picture was um, taken at My Lai, where the massacre occurred 48 years ago. On March 16, 1968, angry and frustrated American soldier entered the, the Vietnamese village of My Lai and began a search and destroy campaign. A short time later, 504 unarmed Vietnamese civilians were killed. The massacre made, was made famous by the army photographer uh, Ronald Haverly. Haverly did not turn in his film to the Brigade Information Officer, fearing the film would be destroyed. He sent them off over to the press. Um, and today, there's a museum at um, Sun Mi Village. Um, the U.S. Um, and in this picture here, it said the U.S. Army investigator returned to Sun Mi in May in November 1960 to ask villagers who have seen the massacre. And then they also found belongings that that were um, you know that were found from from the from the victim. For example, here is a wallet of Miss Pham T. Fan victims in, in Sun Mi Massacre. And then this is the memorial of, of Mi Lai here. So the daguerreotype process has been part of my practice from early days as an art student. The daguerreotype is a unique photographic image on a silver plate invented in 1839. And why holding a daguerreotype viewers see themselves reflecting the mirror surface of the plate. And for this series, um, Collecting Memories, I use the daguerreotype process because of its ability to, to reflect as a mirror and, and its ability when I make this artist book that the image reflects themselves. The image on your left is titled The Memorial, The Memory of Mi Lai Massacre, and the image on the right is The Memorial of Mi Lai. 
The monument recalls the angers and pain that resulted as, as if the victim rose from the dead, having names, memories, and identities. In 2009, I visited Cambodia and made photographs of the Angkor Wat temples and memorial sites that were once known as killing fields. I printed these images using the daguerreotype process. From 1975 to 1979, almost 2 million people lost their lives to murder and phantom when the Khmer Rouge forced their urban population into the countryside to fill their idea of a grand society. Anyone who was in Khmer Cambodia, including many Vietnamese people living in Cambodia, would be executed. The violent backdrop of the Vietnam War encouraged the Khmer Rouge to kill indiscriminately. And so in the series, um, which is called in the, in the Clips of Angkor, I examined the beautiful history of the Angkor empires and also the dark history of the Khmer Rouge regime. The beauty of the, Angkor, the, of the Khmer Empire is depicted in the textual qualities of the Angkor Wat temples, sandstone walls carved with Hindu and Buddhist scenes, teamed with plant and animal life. I, um, as depicted in this vast relief of a Hindu mythology, a snake named Rahu swallowed the sun, causing an ominous eclipse over the Angkor Empire. And in my, my imagination, this um, period took place during the Khmer Rouge regime. It also happened that the Khmer Rouge regime originated near San Reap, taking inspiration from the temples of Angkor Wat's for their distorted ideology. And this daguerreotype depicts one of the many mass graves scattered throughout the landscape. The signs by the tree reads, killing tree against which ex executioner beat children and human bones are left at the base of the tree and covered by the mass graves. Um, this was a torturing room. Um, the devastation of the Vin of Vietnam War again encouraged the Pol Pot regime to kill indiscriminately. Um, and also the US government funded the Khmer Rouge during the Cambodian Vietnamese War, empowering Pol Pot to continue his genocidal program. So as an American, I am responsible for remembering our historical wrongdoing. And as an artist born of Cambodian Vietnamese lineage, now as an American who came to the US as a refugee after the Vietnam War, I wanted to remind Americans of our own historical responsibility in this genocide. And I made this picture by looking behind doors and stairways as I roamed the Tulsan Genocide Museum and I came across an enlarger. And due to the condition of this enlarger and what appears to be a light stand right there on, um, on the edge of the, the photo, I, I assumed that this, um, this might have been the enlarger that the Khmer Rouge used to print the mugshot for their files. Uh, I thought that this enlarger had projected the dead into light and for a moment their lightness becomes photon. So the challenge of re-photographing the photographic portrait at the museum was emotionally impacting for me as I was looking through the viewfinder and seeing what the Tulsing photographer name name in had been have must have seen. I've always found the daguerreotype magical as it represents a spirit. And due to its mirror surface, viewers see their lightness in the photographic image. And I have an example here. The viewer's face also would linger with the scene of the genocide. And the spotlight casting on the daguerreotype plates would project themselves onto the gallery floors and, and viewer's body, like the way an enlarger will, will project the, the film onto a light sensitive surface. And then this is the, um, the, the picture of the enlarger printed as a daguerreotype. And then I contact the, um, the Tulsing Genocide Museum curator about um, this enlarger, because when I found it in the stairway, it looks like it was just on a, a pile of debris. So um, they sent me a picture that they, they saved the enlarger and they had it now, now it's in their collection. Um, and then a, a, a component of this body of work is colorful prints, um, and I printed, um, you know, I made these mugshots 
I printed these Moshe onto leaves so they could be um, m memorial altars. And, and, and in a Buddhist practice, there's a Buddhist practice called meditation on compassion. And I, I hope what's, what the viewer gets out of that by looking at the, the uh, chlorophyll prints. And then going back to the daguerreotype process, I have made photograms onto silver plates of these chlorophyll prints, kind of harking back to the days of uh, botanical specimen that Henry Fox Talbot um, used in some of his uh, artistic work. Um, so the Boat People Refugee Experience. Um, more than 45 years ago, the, um, the fall of Saigon in 1975 marked the end of the Vietnam War, prompting hundreds of thousands of refugees to flee the impending communism regime. More people from Laos, Cambodia follow as those countries experienced communism takeovers in the devastating aftermath of the Vietnam War. And now these are video clips from a VHS tape given to me by a photojournalist named Jim Jensimer, who documented the plaque of Vietnamese boat people in, 19, in 1987. Um, so I appropriated this, these clips, which is now in, in my book, The Enigma of Belonging. So I had to look into my family archives to tell the story visually. In college, I found this Wallace side portrait of my my mother, which was commissioned to help her um, to help mom find a husband, and resulted in my parents' um, arranged marriage. The translation is a lonely person on a boat, and little, little did my mother um, know that the Cambodian man she was going to marry had the the wild idea of taking the family on a boat to flee the takeovers of um, South Vietnam by by the north. And these photos were from my family albums. Um, they were made up a Pula Pidon refugee camp as we waited for asylum. We arrived, we arrived at Pula Pidon on November 6, 1978, and were one of the first groups of boat people. Um, Malaysia, Thailand, Hong Kong, and the Philippines, and Singapore have been considered first asylum countries. Life continues in the refugee camps as people waited for second asylum country to accept them. And on September 12, 1979, a year later, the U.S. Embassy granted my family asylum. Partly due to my father's technical skill, we, we found our way to the United States. So over the summer of 2002, as I prepared for graduate school, I proposed to my mom to visit Pula Pidon now the site of an abandoned Southeast Asian refugee camp. And this picture depicts refugees after being rescued arriving at Pula Pidon Island. And today, Pula Pidon is not a refugee camp anymore. It's an abandoned site. My mom and I found remnants of a forgotten community. Pula Pidon officially opened as a refugee camp in 1978 with 121 Vietnamese refugees. A year later, the number grew to 40,000 Cambodian, Lao Asian, and Vietnamese crowded into the area the size of a football field. And I made this portrait of mom on the beach holding an immigration document that allowed us to enter the United States as refugees. And traveling with her was a quite a fascinating experience. She was the one who remembered the events. I was only a baby at the time. And being on the island allowed her to reconnect with this memory, allowing her not to forget the past, to, but to preserve it and grow from it. And we found traces of history, evidence of despair, hopes, and new beginnings, like this Christ figure being resurrected off the cross. Um, today, this, these residues and remnants are gone, clear out and clean up. While waiting for asylum, one can only dream of a new life. In this case, posters are, are, of cars were very symbolic. One poster was intact and the other was torn up. As refugees, we were unsure of what the future would be um, like for us. Um, and as people waited for asylum, mythological stories and legends were also created. One was about a spirit named Father Bidon 
who save people from drowning. And um, you know, families will dedicate plaques to, to this, um, this figure here. As you can see, him pulling a, um, a woman out of the, the, um, the ocean. And one of the plaques from a Cambodian family speaks about Thanksgiving, a tradition we celebrate to give thanks in our lives. And for me, it also conjures up stories of the pilgrims, and I would say one of uh, American first boat people. And in this photo, we came upon a field of ephemeral documents. These were letters, written testimonies, and governmental records. Some were partly buried in the dirt with plants growing through them, and others were scattered throughout the abandoned building. And these letters were left there waiting for someone to pick them up. So mom and I collected um, as many as we can carry off the island. As people who had to leave everything, we knew that these letters were precious because they contained people's testimony, stories as to why they left as part of their asylum application. Um, this was an ID card issued to Wang um, T. Yung by the UN Refugee Agency. It reads Indo-Chinese displaced person. And I wonder if, if having any form of ID, even about displacement, makes one feel safe. And this um, item um, is called a boat sheet. And a boat sheet was a census of the number of people on a boat conducted when the boat was rescued. And on this form, an officer wrote, 22 people die on the sea by tide which means 22 people were murdered by Thai pirates. So refugees escaped with their life saving, and so they were prone to pirates. And so uh, on, this, on this boat, there was only one survivor. Uh, Tran Truong was 15 years old when he was rescued in, on November 3rd, 1986, at 3 in the morning. It was stories like this that really hit me, stories like this left lingering in the landscape waiting to be told. So I was very drawn to these artifacts and the stories they contain. I scanned some of these letters and enlarged the part where the paper was decaying. Here are were made through the paper, leaving layers of missing information. And I wonder where the information went. Could it all just uh, disappear? So I printed some of these writing onto leaves, suggesting that the content of these documents became part of the natural landscape. And in my imagination, the words and voices echo throughout the soil, plants, and landscape of the island. So in 2011, I was invited by the Sheldon Museum of Art to collaborate with the Vietnamese American community on a project I call Vietnam, Nebraska. Like most immigrants and refugees who, come, who came to the United States, those of the first generation want to preserve their ethnic heritage and tradition. Immigrants resettled in Lincoln, Nebraska, carry their cultural tools to remake the land into something familiar, like little ethnic, like the many ethnic uh, neighborhoods in New York City. Vietnam, Nebraska is about the mixing of the two to be a Vietnamese American. And what I wanted to achieve in this project to, was to present a self-portrait of the community. Um, we practice our tradition in a new land and I love this picture of the, um, the Buddhist community of Lincoln because uh, this American craftsman house was converted into a Buddhist temple. And now this is the larger Vietnamese Buddhist temple. Um, one imagine that you, you would find a Buddhist temple like this in the deep, in, deep in the mountain of China, but it's in the Nebraska landscape. Um, and actually, for many years, the Vietnamese community were fundraising to build this temple, and their dream came true when one of their members won the largest mega lottery jackpot in Nebraska. So, um, this is uh, 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 Tam Vo, um, owner of Century Nails. Uh, this is Tin Nguyen, owners of Vina Grocery Market. And he came up with the name Vina because it is the first two letters of Vin, Vit, V-I, and Nam, N-A. Um, and some of you might not um, know, but uh, Vit, Vin Nam is actually two separate words because in Vietnamese, is a, um, the language is monosyllable, so it's actually two words 
pushed together as one. And it became that way because during the Vietnam War, when they were typewriting, you know, um, uh, news events, they just want to save space. So it became one word. So we see it as one word now. But whenever I think of a Vietnam as a country, I always think of it as two separate words. Um, this image depicts the Asian American seniority group, Sigma and Psi Zeta, setting up for their invasion annual fundraiser banquet. A tongue-in-cheek play on the word invasion, the fears of the foreigner, like the 18, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, or in the wake of the pandemic and acts of anti-Asian hate in our country. Um, the Stop Asian Hate Movement and the resilience of the AAPI community remind us of, the, of Americans' ideals of equality, justice, diversity, and our rights to the pursuit of happiness, liberty, and life. And when I was researching the history of Nebraska, I came across Solomon Butcher's photographs of settlers of the Homestead Act. In these photographs, I saw family units, homes, the landscape, and a sense of prosperity. And since the butcher photographs were made in Nebraska, it was easy for me to make this historical connection to the present Americans. In these portraits of families in front of their homes, I tried to copy the composition of the butcher photographs. The butcher photograph depicts Americans then, and the photographs in this project show Americans today. The faces might change, but the dream is still the same, a place to call home. And this is a photo mural titled Family Story. I didn't want just to show you the surface of homes, but the history that accumulates there, what took place inside the homes. So with, with the help of the student clubs at the university, we collected family photographs to construct this digital mural. Um, and during the exhibit, uh, many people visited, shared stories, and recognized uh, these faces in their communities and some installation shots here. At the end of the exhibit, I kind of just give these photographs away to the participants. And of course, they, they were happy to have them. <laughs> um, this project was exhibited in 2019 at the Louisiana State Museum um, at the Cubildo, the formal Spanish city hall of New Orleans, and the site of um, Louisiana Purchase in 1803. In this project, I explore how Vietnamese Americans farming communities adapt in, res adapt in response to their adopted landscape. In Vietnamese, San La, which is the name of this exhibit, this project means green leaves, the plantel sprouting out of the rich, fertile soil of the New, New Orleans area. As the Vietnamese American child growing up in California, the camouflage uniform worn by actors in Vietnam War movies haunted me in the innocence of my, chi my child's mind. The color green was associated with war, military death, and Asian orange disfolization. And later in my adult life, Vietnamese uh, culture greenness was redeemed in my mother's garden, where Asian organic vegetables were grown to make the delicious Vietnamese meal that nourished my siblings and me. It was also where I had the idea of uh, printing image on leaves through the action of chlorophyll, um, which became one of my signature works as an artist. And when I visit, uh, when I was invited to visit uh, New Orleans, I was already wondering um, about what Vietnamese people here uh, there grow, given that the climate is humid, subtropical, similar to what they would find in Southeast Asia. I marvel at what I saw in this garden, hanging winter melons, elephant ear stalk, red Thai chilies, rice paddy herbs, orca, um, bit of melons, and lemongrass. And the lemongrass is, a, is significant for me as was one of my first earliest me childhood memories. I recall my sister carrying me as my fam and I gathered wild lemongrass growing along the, the highway in our first few weeks in America until a neighbor informed us that we should not do that. <laughs> it was a survival school that we, a survival skill that we 
carry with us when we left the refugee camp in Malaysia where gathering and fishing were to supplement the ration the, the UN Refugee Agency gave us. So these garden portraits in this uh, series represent the Vietnamese community's strength and the immigrants' ability to adapt in their new homeland. Um, many participants expressed that they care for a garden to watch it blossom, nothing more and nothing less. It gives them peace of mind to connect with the land and air. And I just want to show you the climate that the, uh, this Vietnamese community um, lives in, in, in um, the, the Gulf Coast area. So these are some, some clippings from some news events. Um, for example, one is the wars between Vietnamese fishermen and the KKK signal a new type of white supremacy. And decades after clashing with the Klan, a thriving Vietnamese community in Texas. So for the past decade, I have been visiting national parks and the American landscape making daguerreotypes to contemplate the sense of belonging. Um, so, and I, many of you already sort of know this body of work, um, so I'll just kind of maybe go through them. Um, um, so, to, so the daguerreotypes is an obsolete form of commercial photography, and in that way they are truly an art form the daguerreotype does not represent reality the way we see it. Since the plate that goes into the camera is the actual photograph, you get one of a kind photographic object that's richly high resolution. The crystal produced prismatic colors that shift between blues and pinks. And not all plates, plates produce these colors, but when one is near perfect, they are keepers. Um, so in the early years of this medium, people couldn't understand how it was possible to get that many details into an image. Photography was a new form of representation. The fact that a simple camera scare could record a photographic image was astonishing. And because each photograph is unique um, and unreproducible, you will never record the same image twice. Um, so I'll show you here, this is a scene taken with my cell phone. Um, and I, in this case here, I was using these really old 19th century camera um, because I couldn't like, um, afford you know, or, or get a more large modern camera because this was a 10 by 20 inch plate. Um, I sort of had to wrap the camera up in, uh, in my dark cloth. And the camera I was using too was made in India and it was sort of one of the ex Explorer camera, so it was kind of interesting just to uh, imagine like, what this camera had witnessed. Um, and this is a video of a daguerreotype because I've always found that it was very it's hard to show like reproduction of it. Um, and you know, again, I just love the, the idea that um, that um, you know, daguerreotype is known as a mirror with a memory. Um, um, it's a you know, it's, it, it's a mirror that was held up to your face. Um, and remembers your likeness, and that's how people in the 19th century thinks about this process. Um, I'll show you a couple more. This is uh, Dante uh, in Death Valley, Dante's Point. Um, here, this is um, Zaburki's Point. This is a panoramic daguerreotype, an eight, eight by 15 inch plate. And it's hard to tell, but if, if I zoom in here, there's a, a man on a rock here. Um, and as you can notice, it's something we all do often. We look down on our cell phone. So I thought that was kind of cool to capture that moment um, here. This is Delicate Arch at Arches National Park. And this is Sogorio National Park. Over here. Let me double check. I have a few more, I have a couple more slides. I'll just keep going forward. Canyonland. So yeah, I've been working on this, this project for such a long time and it's, it's not something that I, I think is completed. This is Newspaper Rock Historical Site where you find petroglyphs on the way to Canyonland. Um, 
And photographing Petrograd is a way to explore the, the park's dark history, especially with the creation of the National Park as a tool to remove Native Americans off to the land. It's a monumental valley in the Navajo Tribal Park on the Utah-Arizona border. Um, spiral jetty, so you know, I, th I mentioned landscape, um, American landscape is sort of part of this body of work. Um, this is, um, of course, Cynthia O'Sullivan and the Shoshone Fall, um, and um, I also have daguerreotype of Shoshone Fall. Um, some of you might know that that actually is Timothy O'Sullivan in the picture right there, um, posing. Um, and of course, Leto is known about his life. You know, if he um, he was, you know, he was either born in New York or immigrated with his parents at the age of two from Ireland in um, 1842, and he died at the age of 42 from tuberculosis. So it's quite amazing. Um, you know, as much I'm much older than than Timothy Sullivan now in my photographic career, um, and this is Shoshone Fall here. So this is the uh, Shoshone Fall at the Daguerreotype. Yellowstone Fall, and then Old Faithful. So a lot of waters. <laughs> you know, waters is fascinating to me to photograph. I like photographing waterfalls and events like that to uh, sort of shows the uh, the movement of the water, the water as a process that happens in, in, in these parts. And then spaces like Manzanar um, became essential to my work. Manzanar War Relocation Center was one of the 10 camps where the U.S. government incarcerated Japanese nationalists and Japanese American citizens during World War II. And this is Yosemite Valley Chapel. This is Trinity site at White Sand Mission Range. Of course, there's a lot of talk about the atomic bomb lately because of the movie that just released. This is, this is a model of the bomb called Fat Man, and it was um, the bomb that was dropped over um, the, the Japanese city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. And in this picture, I'm thinking about balance. So as I'm photographing these, these very iconic scene, I'm also thinking about like how the formation of the rocks could signify balance and signify like, how does this country balance itself, you know, as, as we continue to, uh, to live together. Um, and once in a while, I also use my film camera. So these are rangers at Craters of the Moon um, holding these, um, thing, these little rocks, which they're, they're actually, they call them bombs, and they were flung from the volcanoes that over at Craters of the Moon. So I thought that the, the word that they're, they call them bombs were kind of fascinating as, it, as if it exists as a, as a war relic or something like that. Um, this piece is actually um, a piece I did for, um, for a Photo Alliance um, fundraiser, and it's called Two Brothers and a Mom. Um, picture here is my mom carrying my brother and me. And one of my favorite rock formations in Yosemite um, Valley is called Three Brothers. It's reflected in the waters of the Merced River during the midsummer season. The Mariposa Battalion in 1851 was named, uh, named the Rock Formation Three Brother after the capture of the three sons of Chief Tanaya near the base of the Rock Formation. The Mariposa Battalion was a California State Militia unit formed in, in 1851 to defeat the Awanichi in the Mariposa War. So the Mariposa War was a part of the broader historical context of the California Genocide and the American Indian Wars. Um, the United States government and California state government and the non-indigenous settler implement policy of displacement and first removal and genocide of Native American tribes during this period. A hundred years later, in 1955, the Vietnam War started. So war-torn consequence of refugees fleeing is an American story in view into our landscape far and near. Um, this is an, a recent body of work ca called Yoso I Am Salinas Chinatown. And in this project, I uh, 
engage with the Salinas Chinatown community um, to make daguerreotype portraits of them and, and to tell their stories. And this, this project features a series of daguerreotype portraits that bring us face to face with the resident of Chinatown. Salinas Chinatown was established on Soledad Street in 1893. It was home to successful ways of immigrants' labor that formed, that formed the backbones of California agricultural economies. Chinese in the 1860s, Japanese in the 1890s, Filipinos in the 1920s, and Mexicans in the 1940s. There were ethnic communities coped with marginalization and, dis and discrimination as they coexist and sought to establish homes and livelihood as immigrants labor. And so this is a, a daguerreotype of um, Salinas Chinatown. As these communities dispersed with urban renewal in the 1970s and 80s, Chinatown deteriorated, business closed, and buildings were boarded up. Today it is known for its homeless shelters, soup kitchen, um, then its rich history. The story of uh, Chinatown's past gives insight into the contemporary struggles around immigration, integ uh, integration, and social cultural marginalization. And I became interested in Salinas Chinatown after reading this article on KQD called, the headline was, Can Salinas Chinatown Design Its Way Out of Violence? I contact an organization in Salinas called ACE, um, which is, means Asian Cultural Experience. Um, Asian Cultural Experience is a multi-ethnic nonprofit organization dedicated to the his historical and cultural preservation of Salinas Chinatown. ACE encouraged me to photograph Chinatown and put me in touch with some locals who can help me um, with, with the project. So I started Daguerreotype type Chinatown in 2017 and in 2019 with the partnership of the Visual and Public Art Program at CSU Monterey Bay, we received a Creative Work Fund grant. Um, so Salinas Chinatown is a population of Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and later Mexicans and African Americans has often portrayed negatively from John Steinbeck East of Eden's to contemporary news headlines. News headlines like this frame a community identity deemly and do little to foster community pride and a sense of belonging. The reality is that Salinas Chinatown has an important 125 year history, a history frequently reduced to homelessness and various health and wellness issue. With this portrait project, I shed another light on the community of Chinatown. I walk around with my camera and a recorder, asking permission to photograph and interview the resident. And sometimes I have my colleague, artist friend, Angelica Miro, who helped me with the Spanish communication. Um, so when I, with the recording, I'm able to coat them um, in the installation um, with the daguerreotype. I'll, I'll read you this one here. I'm a first generation born and raised in Watsonville from Zacatecas, Mexico. I come from resource people. I'm a, re I'm a retired house, a warehouse man who, who drove a stand-up lift for 40 years. I have been in Chinatown for nine years. No source of income until now. I fixed the neighborhood bites. And this Arturo Art Espinoza Jr. Um, also known as the bike man. We all have a story too. We are, we are judged for being homeless, either through, either thought of as drug dealers or prostitutes. Diana um, Baylock, and she also called herself voice of the homeless. Um, I was a Marine. I work at John Hopkins. I went to medical school. He ident identified himself as Junior, AKA Foster Freeze, Kid Rocket, and also Kid Gotti. Chinatown is rough. I was merely happy living on the east side. It was rough living in Chinatown. It's real cutthroat, drugs, people get beat up, stabbed, drug dealers. I don't want to be burdened. 
Homelessness is like a disease. It grabs you and won't let go. Life is too short, and a lot of people out here aren't going to make it. A lot of people never leave this block. It's cold out here. 3 to 5 a.m. is cold as shit. How do, you, how do you help the homeless without having been homeless? Can't stop, won't stop. Lawrence Chambers. And I also looked through the archives of um, ACE, ACE family members. For example, this is a Will, a Willington's Lee collection. And then I made a, a daguerreotype of Willington. And I used this, um, this, this backdrop of this photograph here. I was born and raised in Salinas Giantown at 12 and a half Soledad Street, where I lived with three generations of my family in the back rooms of my grandfather, <coughs> Shorty Lee, Hop, Hop Hing's Lung Company General Merchandise Store. I remember every nooks and cranny there. And this is in the installation here. And um, Wilton um, told me that that um, teenager in the picture is his, his father, was, was his father. So, um, and this, this other daguerreotype is, I learned that the longest running Filipino newspaper in the United States, the Filipinos Mail, 1930s to 1980s, was published in Salinas Chinatown. And this is by Jean Van, Van Waugh. And I'll show you some installation here. Um, this is um, Maria de la Maria, that's how she, um, she identified herself. Um, and I also did some recording of interviewing some of the participants with, uh, with this um, Salinas Chinatown backdrop. Um, and so in the next clip I'm going to show you is a, is a clip of her um, being interviewed. Um, and it's, it's not translated, so there's no, there's no English translation. And I kind of decided to, to do that because I, I didn't want to like, you know, make English as that's the central language. You know, I want to keep it, you know, if you don't speak English, or you don't, sorry, you don't speak Spanish, then you don't speak Spanish. Um, but it was amazing during this interview, she just kind of start to sing. Um, so then this is a clip of that. No, no, no se me hace para que me contara sobre todas mis caras, que tomamos la mano para mí puede ser un bastón viejo, eso, eso va a ser permanente hasta que yo me acabe de componer una trabada. Sí, eso es mucho, gracias. Uno va a encender una, una sala, un cuartito, un baño, y tiene que ocupar capacidad, no estar con tanta gente que gritando, que están como locos, no están como bien, se pelean cada ratito, y luego la gente que, nos ayuda más la gente que vive de fuera, nos traen comida, la gente propia, está malito, si nos ayudan. Ellos saben que esa gente no les da de comer, les traen su comida, ellos les ayuda. Hay gente buena de iglesia, hay gente caritativa que está hasta en la tarde un taquiza y eso la gente se revive. Entonces ellos son gente que son almas perdidas. Yo les canto canciones de, la, de las cien ovejas, de las canciones en la noche, y dicen, ¿por qué canta tan mucho? Porque hacemos ovejas perdidas, descargadas. Si escuchan la abeja, ¿quién decía eran cien ovejas? Eran cien ovejas que había en el rebaño. Eran cien ovejas que aman te cuido, pero en una tarde, al contarlas todas, le faltaba una, le faltaba una, y triste quedó. Las noventa y nueve dejó en el abrisco, y por las montañas, a buscarlas fue, la encontró viviendo, temblando de frío, la cargó en sus brazos, limpió sus heridas y al final volvió. Esta misma historia vuelve a repetirse, todavía yo veo arrebundas van van por el mundo sin Dios, sin consuelo sin Dios, sin consuelo sin Dios, sin consuelo y sin su perdón las noventa y nueve se en el abrisco y por las montañas a buscar las fue la encontró viviendo, temblando de frío, la agarró en sus brazos, limpió 
dulce vida y al final bueno, esa es la canción de Jesús cuando la gente está perdida en las drogas y después se encuentran en avión y recuperan pero hay mucha gente que ya no, el diablo les gana la papá y se matan en el tren se dan balazos, se mueren en el colorado Todo, hace dos, dos días un muchacho se murió de droga todos se murió, se pasaron de droga eran amigos de mi novia y así son mucha gente se va sin, sin Dios sin consuelo y sin Dios, esa es una alabanza que aquí me nace el corazón de la canto no soy santa, pero siento que le, yo le debo mucho a Dios de lo poquito que es Okay. I'll show you a couple more installation shot, and then lastly, I'll show you what I'm kind of working on right now. I'm working on a project called, um, I don't have a title for it yet, but it's actually for um, Houston Photo Fest. Um, and it's the, the theme of the, uh, the group show is Critical Geography. So I've been looking through my archives and, and looking through some of the stuff I collected through the years such as the stereograph here of, um, of um, people in the, the labor basically in, in, in the field. And a lot of these are people who have been colonized or brought over as slaves and working the plantation, as you can see here. So I've been, um, been appropriating these imagery or borrowing these imagery, which I actually like the bird better than appropriation because it's a whole particular art, you know, genre itself. But I've been printing them on um, on silverwares using the daguerreotype process. You could faintly see an image there. It's not as successful as I wanted to, but I, you know, been using other. Um, I found some other plates, and I think this one is a video here, but you can see where I, I had to take copper plates and a plate. It's a really long process to make this happen. But I was telling a student today, like, yeah, this was like a 20, 25 years idea. I had this idea like years ago, and now just sort of like getting around to, to experimenting with it. Um, so yeah, you know, there's the, the thought about, um, the accumulation of wealth through labor, you know, things like that, the accumulation of generation wealth by a you know, particular um, group in our society. And um, let me show you the last slide here. It was just taken, this is taken from this photograph. So recentering, you know, the Asian body. So yeah, so I can open up for uh, Q and A if anyone has any questions. And it's hard to see. So if you want to just shout out your question, it's totally fine to you because I can't, can't see any hand raised or anything. <laughs> mm. Is that a hand raised? OK, great. I feel like I've always been like an artist. Like I, I kind of like came into this world like interested in like making with doing things with my hand and making art. And I just remember when I was in like um, as a kid in summer school or summer camp, learning to watercolor for the first time, and I just like whoa, this is so cool to put you know paint onto paper. Um, and as a kid, I always like love exploring. I love like going into the backyard, looking at butterflies, and running around in like the, the weeded area. Um, so that's a really hard hard question. But I mean, there's 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 ways to answer where like okay, I call myself an artist because now I have this degree. I went to like art school, and I got a 
a BFA and I have an MFA now and then now I'm a professional artist. Um, but yeah, it's, all, it's something that I, I encourage my student to think about, to call themselves artists too, as soon as possible, because then there is no like second doubt who they want to be. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I hope I hope I answer your question um, in in ways that are good. I guess I don't know. <laughs> I think one thing, as you can probably tell, um, I'm also like very uncertain about things, and I think that's one thing about being an artist. It's like you never feel like anything is finished and everything's done, and you just keep doing it. And, and even though like what you do might not be the best work, but it's some work and you just keep marching forward, making, making new work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, how does the, the plate photography thing work? I forgot what the thing was called. Oh, the, the, the daguerreotype process? Oh yeah, so that's, um, that's it. So basically it's a super plate um, film with iodine vapor and then iodine it's, so iodine is a salt becomes a silver salt and that's when the plate becomes sen light sensitive and then so then from there on you've you also film it over bromide which is another halogen that increases the speed of the plate to make it faster then you expose it in the camera and then you develop um, over warm mercury. So I do everything in a um, film hood in my van when I'm out on location. So I, I basically synthesize. It takes me like 20 minutes to march to, I don't march, but you know, to hike to a, a, an area, photograph, and then hike back and then develop the plate and see if I like it. So I spend like the whole day in one place. So it's never really fun with me. Like when I go to the National Park, it's really boring because I'm spending eight hours trying to photograph the same scene over and over. And then the lighting is always changing, so my exposure time is always changing, and the element is also sort of like, you know, becomes part of the process. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? We have, I think, one there. Oh, hey. Hello. Hi. Um, one of the pieces that was really standing out to me as being so poetic and beautiful was representation uh huh. Yeah, and too slim. In that case, I'm curious about your perspective on photography as it relates to the act of claiming or reclamation, um, clearly for repurposing uh, those previously captured photos and bringing new light to them. And uh huh. Saying that uh, you know those portraits became photons and again the representation became photons. Oh yeah. So so I guess maybe in these sort of. Um, series here. Yeah, you know, when I, um, you know, I've totally forgot I photographed that larger, like, it was, it didn't even occur to me when I was just looking through my, um, my files to get that, wow, that's the larger that I saw. So it, it sort of helped me to meditate, like, what, what is in the larger? You know, of course, the larger is a tool we use um, to enlarge our negatives, to print it bigger. But what's that, that, the, that thing that happened when you like make that image into photons, you know, make, it becomes too light and it somehow it is like set free, you know, becomes energy in a way. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, like for example, during um, uh, Abu Ghraib and of course all the Iraq war and all that, um, Guantanamo, like photographic tools used as objects of torture, I guess. And in a way, these, these when the Khmer Rouge um, photographed these people, it was in a way, a way to sort of like, I mean, torture them because it became part of their file. It became like a reason to torture them. So I was always fascinated like how photographic tools, you know, it's, it's like, I always say it's like a typewriter. You know, it's like how you use it, right? And of course, um, with, with with photography, you know, if, you know, you could totally use it in the wrong way too, like they did in Abu Ghraib. And then, and of course, in this in this instance here in this project, I'm trying to use photography in, in another way, which is sort of memorializing people and bringing them back to life. And that's what like I think photography does best is that it re resurrects people, 
you know, you find a picture of someone and you see them, you don't know who they are, like 19th century or vernacular picture. And I always love, love this quote by uh, Christian Botinsky. He said, like, you die twice, you know, you die when you actually die, and you die when someone picks up a photograph of you and don't know who you are, you know, and like you, you die again somehow, you know. It's, um, so that find out it's sort of just magical that we, you know, we're as a species, you know, we, we make pictures of ourselves, you know. Um, but I don't know, I, I, I forgot your question, sorry. <laughs> so you, if you have other to add, I'm happy no, to. Perfect. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we have a few, we have, yeah, there's the mic going to the back there, okay. Hey man, it's Christine. I have two oh, questions. Oh, hey, Christine. <laughs> uh, sorry, Tim. I have two questions. Um, and you can pick which one you want to answer. My first one is about, like, the national art series. Mm -hmm. And, like, what is the relationship uh, to you with belonging to those? And does awe play a role? That's number one. Number two is um, so much of your work carries this very heavy, intense um, violations of humanity, right? Like, um, how do you how do you cope with carrying mm. these stories? Yeah. Um, so, two great questions, and I feel like I have to answer them both in some ways. But the first, the first question about awe and the national park and. You know, it just all dated back for me, like always wanting to go camping, going out into the, the, the wilderness. But, you know, my parents um, didn't think that was something we should do because, you know, they associate the word camp to refugee camp. And it was something we did. Really, we did for real. We were a refugee camp. We were within the elements. But for me, like I was going to like to my best friend's home. I mean, it was a white boy and seeing pictures of his family going camping I was like I feel like oh I want it. I want that too um, so you know the the National Park is complicated in that way is because it was designed for Americans to feel rooted to this land right it's designed for all Americans but of course not all Americans are accepted there in ways you know um, it, first just getting there it's cost cause a lot of planning and time off and work or money. Um, it's also for me like nav you know when I started this project in 2012 it was my first time to um, to National Park to Yosemite Valley and it was like sort of like um, navigating through these like um, really conservative part of the country where you see Trump signs and stuff like that. And then you get into the National Park you, you pass this gate and you feel like you're in this federal land and like all that's imbued with like you know this idea of the constitution and life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and stuff like that so so that part for me is the awe part you know even though for most people like the awe is like the actual event that's happening in front of them the the waterfalls the rocks you know all that but for me the the awe that this was created in some way to for this idea yeah now I forgot your second question. Uh, you want, do you want to uh, re summarize your second? Question? Oh yes, yes. Well, you know, so when I was a kid, I mean, I, again, just growing up, seeing imagery of war, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm like desensitized to them, um, but it was something I was very um, attracted to. Like these were like life and death situation, whatever it is, it could be war, it could be, it could be racial violence, you know, it was just, just stories like that, that kind of, you know, like, a lot, you know, makes me imagine like what, like being at that moment, you know, it's, it's kind of weird to say that, but it's like, I'm trying to like picture myself at that event, you know, if I was involved in, or if it happened to me, um, so, so I mean, through through the work, I feel like I'm like somehow um, packaging it up in a different way, so then my my audience and viewer could also look at the work and not turn away, like we will turn away by looking at war photography, you know. And we and it's so easy today when we're on online when we see image of war, let's say you know Ukraine or something like that, it's easy for us to click away. But I think that's like the power with art is that it's able to take a subject and transform it in a, in a new way for us to 
to understand it. And it doesn't, of course, it's not going to reach the massive, you know, but at least it reach a certain amount of people, and hopefully that would change hearts and minds. Yeah. Yes? Um, that actually kind of naturally leads into the, the question I wanted to ask, which is really sort of about audience, uh, just because I feel so very privileged to know of you and your work and consider you to be one of the most profound thinkers and profound feelers and, and empaths uh, in the world and creating these truly magical, magical objects. And um, uh, and I was just wondering if you could just further expound a little bit on, on what you were just about to say, maybe more of about audience. like. What are, what are the strategies? How do you feel about like reaching the widest audience? Because I feel like my access to your work comes from a real place of privilege in terms of how I get to it from cultural organizations or in a lecture hall at an mm -hmm. art school. Um, how do you feel about strategies about audience and making sure indeed that you reach as many people as possible with some of the most profound work that exists on the planet? Um, wow, that's an um, interesting question. And, and since, you know, I also, of course, we all work in the arts, you know, um, and we work with it within these pr 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 uh, primers, you know, where like we have shows, we make the work, we have shows, and we exhibit, and we try to, you know, display the work, talk about it. And, and I've been using those, those methods, and I haven't really figured out another way, you know, because I'm not, I'm not like a street artist. I'm not, you know, I don't have um, a big Instagram follower, you know, <laughs> under 2,000, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's an interesting question for me to think about, but I, I don't know if I'm trying to reach, like, like the m mass, you know, in, in a way. I would like to, but it's not something I'm also um, really after, too. I, I, I mean, for me, like, the, the, one of the things that must... I have done so much of my career lately was just a book being published. And I was telling the group of students today, but that only has like a thousand copies. It's not like it's kind of, you know, reaches reach everybody, but at least it so, somehow kind of gets onto other um, decision makers, curators, desks, and hopefully that could also foster more exhibit or dialogues. And um, yeah, I. I yeah, I mean, but my audience is like my audience. That's, I think that's the one thing that I, I, I don't think like I have an audience. An audience just kind of come to the work. And I mean, when you're making work, I know you've probably heard this before where you're like, you're your first audience, which is true. You know, I'm my first audience because I'm trying to figure out like what's this thing I'm doing? What's this subject about? What I'm going to discover? Where am I going to break new grounds with the process? So it's sort of for me working through the process for myself. And you know, if I'm fortunate, I'm able to share that with, with people. And I've been really fortunate in my art career to be able to do that, to be in a room with you all and talk about the work. You know, so. And it's not always an easy thing for me to do, too. So as you know, as you can tell. But I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, and it, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jujimi. Uh, your presentation, but my question is, um, with you sharing all the different photographic processes and how complex they are, is photography something that you see part of like your spiritual practice, or is this something that is a bit te just technical in that realm? Oh, that's really interesting. I, I, lo I love this question. Um, you know, first, photography has always sort of been with me. Um, and when, as I mentioned, because the lack of photographic imageries I had growing up, but also it was also on our family altars, like pictures of the dead. So, so talk about spiritually. I mean, that's what my mother would pray to when she, in moments of her life, she needs, you know, she needs help. She calls to the ancestor. So it be so the 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 picture, the photographic of the of family members were like, um, you know, as you mentioned. Um, you know, it, it is a religion. It is like a. I mean, you're. It's like a, uh, you're talking to the dead. You're talking to God, and and it's funny too because in alternative processes, you know, there's always a phrase like you're, you just pray to the photo gods, whatever that means. You know, like that this this thing happened for you, like everything lines up. And I think that's the you know, in working this territory is where like the magic comes in. Um, 
So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And also just to echo your sentiment about uh, the extent you're really focusing on the Asian body, uh, that's always the that kind of presentation is really powerful for me. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, any other questions and thoughts? Oh, we have one. Um, yeah. Okay, so I will be the last question, I guess. Um, I have oh, oh yeah, I'm having one. Okay, one more question. Okay. Um, do you want to Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, on and off again. Uh, I had a question about um, material, like about materials, and if for your oracle prints, if there's like any significant sort of specificity around the specific plants you're using, um, if those choices are purely technical, which will, like which plants maybe mm -hmm. make the best print, or if you have any, um, you know, specific choice behind each plant, if they have like, s yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was working on the the work of, about the Vietnam War immortality, I mean, I, I was trying to use plants that are native to Southeast Asia, the tropical plants, to sort of um, tell that story. I did this other body of work, um, which I didn't show tonight, um, when about the uh, um, the Civil War, and I collaborated with a poet. And in that project, we we use um, like leaves from like the South and things like that. stuff we sort of just pluck off the ground, like coastal leaves. And we also use some witness leaves or witness trees. Uh, well, leaves of witness tree with a parks ranger permission. We were able to print um, imageries of Confederate and Union soldier on these um, witness trees on um, leaves. So, so that's you know play into the that history. So it's something that you know touch you know goes deep into the soil in the time period that the when the events happen. So, and then the other part too, some of it's technical too, like what works best you know to make it happen. Um, yeah, maybe one, one last question. <laughs> yes, last question. Um, I was in a World in Maps series, and uh, yeah. um, your why you, the material on why you, why you choose to uh, print one of the days. Yeah. Uh -huh. Also, can you share with me this day and the other photos? And also, regarding the eagles on the casting uh, um, objects for the memories. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, so um, I, the, the, the idea was to, to print on, uh, on let me go to, maybe go to this sample, where these, these are like sort of um, 19th century silverwares, or even, you know, maybe some of this, they're not really from that time period, but the design kind of harkens to wealth and imperialism you know, um, colonialism, so it's accumulation of wealth through forced labor, you know, through the, the economies of, um, so, so kind of like for me, uh, what I wanted to, to just highlight that, you know, like, you know, the, the effort for, uh, you know, um, people who've been colonized, which is a lot of, you know, people of color, you know, that wealth was really built off on the labor of these land, you know, so that, that sort of signified that, just like to look into a silver platter and then see like the imageries of plantations and, and you know, so, so the other thing too is like the, this, now like a lot of these pictures were made for like the, the um, colonial gaze, you know, where I imagine it would be Anglo people buying serograph, looking at these, almost looking at these as, as something to be proud of, you know, like be able to, to um, maybe in their mind like civilize and and build these like sort of plantations. But I want I wanted to have like crop the picture where the people and stares back at the viewer, like stare back at us. So that's the reason why these crops are really tight, you know. Um, where where they can actually um, reverse that gaze onto onto us, you know, onto this history. Um, so hopefully, the people who never have a can afford to be in the silver. Yeah, and, and but also 
in, in a way, I, I feel like a lot of like the way I use pictures of the past is also to give like to give these people justice, you know, because of course they didn't agree to be photographed. Um, you know, for example, this Carte Visique is so strange of this, um, you know, man in the middle, white man in the middle with the two, you know, servants, and one is like sitting on the floor, one is, you know, it's sort of like bringing, um, pulling the attention to them, but also allowing them to tell, like, their story, and tell their story through, you know, our imagination of what that could be, so. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you so much.